Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I'm going to get right into it. It's a pretty severe week, a pretty severe month, it's a pretty severe quarter, and uh, hopefully this is the very last thing you'll be doing related to your portfolio or the market before you go into the Christmas weekend. Um, I kind of would like to be delivering a little better present than what's going on in the market, but it has been quite abrasive here for a little while, and uh, that's it's not getting any better. The volatility levels remain high. And this is what happens. It's very important. It's a big theme of what I want to talk about this week. This is what happens when everything is completely sentiment driven. Like, is there some fundamental news out there that is causing an acceleration of a market sell off? There's certainly not. Have earnings decelerated? Is there warnings or guidance that into Q1 or even Q2 earnings are going to be slowing? No, nothing like that. Uh, the two big headwinds that exist in the market, they're what I've called for about a month now, this two-headed monster. They're very known, they're very digestible, but there hasn't been any new news around the fact that we have the uh, tightening going on in monetary policy, which I'm going to be talking about more in a moment in light of the Federal Reserve's activity this week. And then um, the trade war with China. And we know that there's sort of this 90-day period that we're kind of waiting to see what comes out of that. So you have no additional news, but you have an additional 1,000-point sell-off, which was on top of another 1,000-point sell-off week before, which was on top of you know the 1,500 points that had sold off in the five, six weeks before that. From the high level on September 20th, which is a pretty arbitrary amount, uh, but that high level on the S&P 500 to where we are as I'm sitting here talking right this second, S&P is down about 15 or 16%. Now, I think the S&P was up 7%, 8% going into that. So, you know, you're only talking about um, on the year, uh, like 7%, 6% drop in the S&P uh, total from January 1 till now. But from the high level, it's double-digit return. And if it gets to 20%, that's a, what they call a bear market. The, the kind of vocabulary, semantics around the stuff is somewhat immaterial. But the fact of the matter is, I want you to think about this for a second. Um, on my screen right now, municipal bonds are now up on the year. They've been down 1%, 2 3% all year. Floating rate bank loans are up. In fact, the highest rated asset class, the only one of the only asset classes in positive territory. The, the bond stuff that has now really picked up a lot in the last month or so, it's picked up from being down 2% uh, uh, to 0% basically. You know, you have no asset class showing an even 1% positive return or better on the year. Floating rate bank loans, I believe, are up about 1.4% or something, and that changes, you know, day by day. So so here, here's kind of where things are. Uh, when I refer to the sentiment, there's no catalyst for buying. It's late in the year. There are a lot of tax law selling events to do, including our own. We had done that over the last couple of weeks, which is very sensible and efficient things to do. Um, but no institutional money managers that buy in size want to kind of jump out right now. And the overall backdrop has these different headwinds, questions about oil, the Fed, China, uh, I am literally blown away. I've had a lot of deja vu moments in my career, and I've had a lot of market events that felt like other market events. But I've never experienced something so eerily similar to late 2015 as what we're experiencing now, late 2018, where A, markets were accelerating us off into the end of the year. It had already been a very choppy year. Things were down, but they're not down huge. Like on the year, it's single-digit drops. Um, but... It's all centering on the same exact conversation topics, oils, rather uh, sudden drop, questions and concerns and headwinds around monetary policy tightening, and then the global economic conditions. The way that played out is things sold off further in 2015. China dropped a bomb on global markets in January 2016 by announcing a huge amount of capital that left their country and more aggressive efforts to... Uh, weaken their currency and to kind of remain competitive. And you had a massive sell-off in January. And then the way it ended up ending, and I'm not forecasting this is what happens in 2019. I'll be writing about this in this big white paper we're doing to kind of go into 2019. So I don't want to really give away the story here yet because I'm still kind of formulating the, the thesis that we're working off of. 
But what did happen in 2016 is oil prices stabilized and it began a rebound. Uh, China uh, ended up uh, going through a pretty extended period of a sort of soft landing and some of their economic slowdown, growth slowdown. And the, um, the other issue about the Fed was that they chickened out entirely. They were forecasting four interest rate hikes in 2016 and they didn't do any of them. Will there be the same global central bank coordination in 2019 that was in 2016? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I talked this week in DividendCafe.com about oil where it's a, it's a conundrum because it isn't like the market wants high oil prices. Consumers and producers, I mean, oil is an input price. We like lower cost, but it's a collapsing oil price that the markets don't like because of what it means to capital expenditures, uh, industrial production, um, the bank loans that maybe underwrite some of that space and high yield bond market. So it's more like is oil is a collapsing oil price a sign of weakness globally that markets are concerned about. But then a real high oil price is a problem because it's a high input cost that producers and consumers have to bear. So there's sort of like a sweet spot in this Goldilocks analogy. And I suspect you end up kind of finding that in between 50 and 60 is a rough estimate into early 2019. But, but as far as the issues with the Fed, it dominated most of the market story this week. And, and yet, in theory, you would think the Fed kind of said what the market wanted to do. I'm going to point out in a moment why they didn't. But what the market um, wants is for the Fed to say, OK, we've been tightening aggressively to get to normalization. And we think we've kind of gotten to normalization. And the inflationary fears that would cause us to continue accelerating taking liquidity out of the system, the inflationary fears are not there. So we're, we're crying uncle. We're, we're going to reverse course, so to speak. Well, what Chairman Powell said this week was basically that, but he didn't really act upon it. He said, OK, we were going to raise rates three times next year now or, or maybe four. Now we're going to do maybe two or three. So he kind of backed off one rate hike. Um, my personal opinion is that they'll end up doing one next year, not three and certainly not four or five. Um, but that, but that, that's subject to change too. But uh, you should listen to the Advice and Insights podcast this week. I delve into this a little more, and I don't have the time to get into it exhaustively here. But the bigger issue, the, the media's not talking about this because it's too complicated. It's too esoteric. It wasn't about the interest rate policy. We knew, the futures market said that we, everyone knew they were going to raise rates yesterday. And maybe he could have given a little more dovish language that markets would have liked on rates, but he did kind of say, all right, we're sort of backing down a little next year on the interest rate side of things, but it's their balance sheet. It's the amount of excess reserves they've created in the financial system. When they did this thing called quantitative easing before, they're now doing quantitative tighten tightening. They're undoing the quantitative easing. And they're by reducing the balance sheet, they're reducing dollar liquidity in the economy. They've been doing a real, real slow measured rate. They've picked up that rate a bit. And I think that the powers that be in the market would have loved for him to, them to say, we're questioning if we need to kind of moderate that. Instead, he said, no, we're real happy with it. We like the way it's going. We have no plans to change that. I truly believe that's what would kind of reverse course middle of this week. Um, now, all that to say, should that be bearish? Like are, if they stick with that, will that be concerning? It's hard to say. It depends on the economic data. Um, and then I guess the other question is not only should they, but will they stick with it? That I'm more question, I'm more skeptical about. But yeah, you got to listen to the Vice and Insights podcast for this to be elaborated on more because I'm going to lose some of this video viewing audience if I keep talking about quantitative tightening. Um, that's more of the type of stuff I talk about at home with my kids. Okay, what else do I want to get into here this week? DividendCafe.com is a long one this week and you can understand why. Um, I encourage you to look at it to see the exact language the Federal Reserve had in their uh, announcement this week and the exact language they had three years ago at this time. It's uncanny how similar it is. Um, and I think I'll close out with this, that it's hard to find kind of, um, uh, you know, a bright side or a half full glass through this. It's been as bad a month as we've had in 10 years uh, so far. We'll see how the quarter and the month ends. All the positive returns have, have kind of been ripped out of equity prices here in the last few weeks for the year. 
And yet, um, ass allocation is amazing. It's just amazing to me. You, we see really attractive, positive returns across our alternative investments, um, which we overweighted well this year. And we see bonds, which were not only everyone hating on earlier in the year, but everyone hating on them for the purpose or wanting to buy more equities. And now you've seen a significant buffer in the equity price downward volatility coming from the fixed incomes offsetting so much of that. As uh, treasury yields have dropped substantially, the fact that we're sitting here right now at a 2.8 10 year, and we were at 3.25 like a month ago, that's a massive drop in bond yields, meaning a huge pickup in prices. And so everyone's saying, oh, you want short duration, we don't want long duration. The longer duration you had, the more money you've made in bonds. Um, there are no asset classes I've ever seen that confound people and defy their own human intuitions more than the bond market. It's a stunning um, vehicle for humiliation. And if not humiliation, at least humility. So an asset allocated portfolio is down, but it is down significantly less than what equities have incurred during the sell-off because asset allocation is doing what it's supposed to do. Alternatives, bonds, different aspects of stocks fitting in uh, together. I'm really hesitant to go into what a lot of these asset classes have done on the year here at the very end of December because I want to get final year in data and give you some real special and, and updated finalized metrics at, at the beginning of 2019. But um, all that to say, behaviorally, it's, there's very little to count on. I don't see this volatility stopping. I don't see a catalyst for rebound in the next week or two. Half of Wall Street won't even be working. And there's no real fundamental news coming. But it's fear-driven, it's not fundamental-driven. And history is not kind to people who capitulate to somebody else's fear. Your fundamentals and your portfolio and your asset allocation should drive what you're doing. The fear embedded around the market right now is not fundamentally driven. And that is a fact. And it is um, about the best news I can share with you. I should say second best news. The best news is it's Christmas. Go enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And we'll uh, come back to you here soon enough. Reach out anytime. Merry Christmas.